his voice is lifted, he sings his joy, now is the season to sing our song of life. Come, let all Lord your glory show us your face, for we know your words are mine. Good evening, dear friends. Welcome again to the class. Let us ask God's blessing as we begin the class. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the loving Father, we thank and praise you for this beautiful day, for this pleasant evening. Lord, as we are about to listen to your word through the prophet Jeremiah, Lord, enlighten our mind. As we listen to your word, bless us that we may take delight in your word. We also pray for Father Shabu as he takes the class that he may be enlightened and that he may be directed by your spirit. Let us pray together this prayer. Come, go down to the porter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the porter's house, and there he was working at his will. The, ve the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the porter's hand. And he worked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Loving Father, thank you for the truths in your word. Thank you that you are forming me into the person you want me to be. Help me to lie willingly in your hands, for I trust you to form me into the vessel that you want me to be. To your praise and glory. Amen. The Mother Mary, guide and assist us as we listen to the word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of you, from Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without an Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once again, good evening, and welcome to the class. Now I ask Father Shabu to take over and begin the class.
Shabbat Shalom, Shalom dear friends, good evening, good afternoon and good morning. So this weekend uh, brings us to the second uh, confession of uh, Jeremiah and hopefully if there is time we will also take the third confession. So we are uh, planning to um, continue uh, with uh, chapter beginning with chapter 14. 15, 16, and if possible, also 17, because uh, uh, up to 17 uh, forms uh, a particular section. Okay, so um, we will uh, continue. I will share the screen. Um, we saw the chapter up to 13 yesterday. Okay, once again, our popular passage. When I read, please try to learn that by heart and keep it in your heart. Keep repeating um, again and again in your heart. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. We will go to a very familiar uh, verse that comes in uh, today's class and that will take... Uh, that will serve as the theme jeremiah chapter 15 16 your words were found and i ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for i am called by your name o lord god of hosts I suppose the word of God is uh, joyful. It brings us joy, brings delight to our heart. And that's the reason why we are participating in this pilgrimage of God's word. Okay, uh, we move to chapter 14. As I men just mentioned, 14, 16, 17 will form a particular uh, section called crime and punishment, uh, judgment and ostracism. This is basically a lament over catastrophic drought and the coming military defeat of Jerusalem. That is in uh, chapter 14 and beginning of 15. Okay, let's go to the text. I won't, I may not be explaining uh, everything in detail, except maybe the second uh, confession that takes place in chapter 15. But I will uh, leave any uh, section as such. At least uh, I will comment on uh, each of the passage or each of uh, the pericopas we uh, technically call. Uh, chapter 14, 1 to 6. Chapter 14, 1 to 6. Um, okay, by now, all of you are familiar with the prophetic word. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord, please remember, all that the prophet speaks, because he is God's prophet, is God's word. God's word. Prophet is only the mouthpiece. Therefore, this word is divine. If it were only the words of uh, Jeremiah, 
we would not be spending time and even after 2,600 years and generations after generations still contemplate the words spoken through the mouth of Jeremiah because they are God's word. Okay, chapter 14, 1 to 6. It's about the drought that's going to fall uh, upon uh, uh, Judah. See, in the Middle East, when the winter rains fail for two or three years, drought and famine are sure to follow. The drought described in verses 2 to 6, um, you will see how catastrophic this drought is. Probably it refers to a historical situation. In any case, this caused a national emergency. Uh, historically, we may be able to place it to the great drought that occurred in Judah during the reign of Jehoiakim. So this oracle probably goes back to the time of the reign of Jehoiakim. And you look at the details. The drought has brought the whole nature to a standstill as if struck by death. The situation has thrown the population into mourning. Look at verse 4. The farmers are dismayed. They cover their heads. Covering the wailing of one's head is one of the classical biblical sign of mourning. Uh, the examples that are drawn are from the life situation of Palestine, from the city, from the countryside, from the forest and wilderness. So making use of these details, Jeremiah describes the drought. Let us uh, just um, call out a few uh, important uh, passages here to show the intensity of the drought. As I said, it is common that in the Middle East, um, on certain years, even two years, three years, four years, there isn't uh, rain, and that will lead definitely to an intense drought and famine. Okay, the details are here. The nobles send their servants for water. So you may be very rich. You may be coming from uh, an illustrious family. They have no water. And then servants come to the water tanks. They find no water and return with their pitchers empty. So dismayed and bewildered, they cover their heads. Um, because the soil is all cracked, since the country has had no rain, the farmers are dismayed, they cover their heads. Even the hind in the field forsakes her newborn calf because there is no grass. Oh, the wild asses stand on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals, and their eyes pale because there is no herbage. So they all uh, illustrate the intensity of uh, the drought. Now, verses 7 to 9, the lament of the people, lament of the people. 
So prostrating on the ground, they use the prayer that they use generally or they recite generally on the day of repentance. Um, verse 7. Please look at the text. Although our iniquities testify against us, act, O Lord, for your name's sake. Our apostasies indeed are many, and we have uh, sinned against you. Then it goes on, O hope of Israel. So this is part of the prayer that they recite prostrating as a sign of repentance. So this is a communitarian lament. So what happens here? First, the people confess their sins and using the covenantal formula, recalling to mind what God has done for them and the promises that the Lord made to them, they plead with God to remember. Okay, those of you who have been following me um, in uh, Genesis and Exodus will definitely remember this biblical word, remember. Remember is a covenantal term that God will not abandon his people. No? Uh, especially we saw in the case of uh, Rachel, Rachel, wife of Jacob, when she was barren, the Lord remembered and God opened her womb and she was, uh, um, she was able to bear a son. So to Samuel and other people. So remembering and Exodus very prominently used God remembered Israel in their uh, slavery. God remembered Noah, all covenantal terms. So this text also makes use of the covenantal term to, to confess their sins and acknowledge their iniquities. Please um, look at this um, phrase. For your name's sake, or we are called by your name. In different passages in the Bible, we will come across this phrase. We are called by your name, or uh, for your name's sake. This, again, is theological. That Yahweh protects them by his salvific presence. When you say, Lord, you are or we are called by your name means I, we belong to you because you chose us and we are your portion. We are sorry, part of your own existence and there is uh, an element of uh, protection. So something that uh, Yahweh cannot forget that he will protect itself. Uh, Meaning, we are called by your name. So repeatedly, this phrase appears in the Old Testament, uh, not just in uh, uh, prophetic literature, but even in the Deuteronomist history, um, even uh, also in the Pentateuchal tradition. Uh, verses 14. Uh, to verses 14, 10 to 12, there is the um, answer of uh, Yahweh. They remember in their need, they remember God. In their prosperity, they forget Him. History repeats itself. This is also our experience, often our own experience. We remember, we call upon God in times of need. And in times of prosperity, God is relegated to the background. And this is also uh, found in this text. Um, no intercession or ritual acts will avert the divine punishment. 
the prophet's uh, intercession will be in vain and the people's sacrifices are useless um, in this uh, section um, we come across uh, three classical uh, plagues three classical plagues so famine and pestilence you know this is uh, just like the biblical triad of uh, widow orphan and a foreigner this is uh, another triad three classical plagues um, which uh, we come across in many many passages in jeremiah and elsewhere war famine and pestilence um, here we have in verse 11 and this will be repeated also elsewhere as uh, i have uh, indicated in the uh, text of the slide just a sample of uh, references the sword famine and by pestilence i consume them um, See, look at verse 11, the first part. Sorry, what I was telling you about uh, the three classical plagues are in 12, uh, verse 12. But in 11, um, the futility of uh, the intercession of the prophet. I know this is uh, this can be scandalous because by virtue of the calling prophet is also asked to intercede if only you were to read uh, amos how amos uh, uh, re uh, restricted or even uh, uh, changed the mind of god no, but the, pro uh, the theology of that time god could uh, uh, god's mind could be changed because uh, the prophets uh, intercede for uh, the people and so but here because uh, of the type of um, uh, punish, uh, sins, even the intercession of the prophet will be in vain. Um, and consequently, uh, three classical plagues will uh, come into the land of Israel, will affect them, war, famine, and pestilence. Um, Jeremiah blames this situation on the false prophets. I have mentioned uh, elsewhere, one of the most difficult uh, responsibility is to decipher, to um, uh, discern who is Yahweh's prophet and who is uh, false prophet. Uh, one of the easiest ways to find uh, who a uh, prophet who is uh, Yahweh's prophet God's prophet is to look at the uh, life of the prophet but is taking people to Yahweh he is God's prophet if he takes away from Yahweh he is a false prophet or secondly if what a prophet speaks in the name of God does not come true he's a false prophet if it comes true he is the god's prophet uh, he will come across a false prophet here jeremiah blames uh, the false prophets for the present situation because the false prophets have spoken of a time of peace and prosperity ahead for the days to come in judah while disaster is in store for the people of Judah. This is false uh, prophecy. So in order to uh, make people comfortable, feel good, the false prophets spoke of a, a time of peace and prosperity. While Jeremiah knew, the real prophet knew that disaster was imminent. God answers Jeremiah by condemning 
both the prophets and the people uh, to sword and famine. Uh, that is uh, violence and natural calamities. Now, I would like to spend a few minutes on these uh, two theologies in conflict. Okay, this is a uh, part of it is only a revision. I have mentioned already twice. So now, um, to understand uh, Jeremiah, it's good to go back to this uh, two contrasting, conflicting ideas prevalent. Because uh, uh, even uh, uh, well-meaning prophets um, appointed, nominated by God himself would take different stand. So you are already familiar with the Royal Zion theology that I have mentioned uh, at least a couple of times. That is, uh, um, no, uh, David and um, his descendants, Davidic uh, uh, posterity, Davidic lineage will be on the throne of David in Judah, irrespective of the life of Israel or Judah. So, and that um, idea was uh, vehemently emphasized by Isaiah himself. And Zion, the Temple Mount, will be protected by God because that is God's own residence. How can God be destroyed, God's own house be destroyed? So they believed that heaven and earth might pass away, but the temple in Jerusalem would last forever. That was their belief. Uh, even uh, uh, probably Isaiah believed in this theology. So um, the promise made to David will come true and uh, Zion, the Temple Mount, will be a permanent abode. So that's the Royal Zion theology. And opposed to that is the Sinaiti Covenant theology propagated in the Book of Deuteronomy and many theologies based on Deuteronomy. What is this Sinaiti Covenant theology? That it's a conditional. If you obey my words and follow the commandments I give to you, you will possess the land. So this is conditional. Then you shall be my people and I will be your God. Um, read uh, once again, if you get time, chapter 27 and especially 28 of Deuteronomy. Uh, by now, all of you know this. That if the covenantal stipulations are not fulfilled, Yahweh will reject the treaty made on Mount Sinai and they will not be able to inherit, occupy the land. They will be expelled from the land. And that will take us to uh, chapter uh, 3 of uh, Genesis. No? The, there was a condition. You shall not eat from this particular tree. And uh, what was the result? At the end of the story, they are expelled, expelled from the uh, paradise, from the Garden of Eden, God's own garden. Expulsion. It is there. And soon after that, after the murder of Ebel by Cain, he is expelled. He goes uh, to a place called Nord, as a, a nomad, as a wanderer, wanderer, he also is expelled from the land. So this expulsion is the result of the lack of fidelity. Okay. Um, now, Jeremiah, um, especially if you read chapter 28, and his contemporaries um, 
I think I made a mistake in the slide. Let me see. Okay, sorry, it's correct. Uh, not Jeremiah. Uh, this is correct. Hananiah, uh, who is uh, mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 28, together with uh, um, Isaiah and other prophets, upheld the royal Zion theology. Um, so that at the time of Jeremiah, there would be uh, this contradiction, um, debate between these two theologies held by different prophets. So Hananiah at the time of uh, Jeremiah would uh, subscribe to royal Zion theology while Jeremiah, Jeremiah will propagate, uh, promote the Sinaitic covenantal theology that your life uh, will be judged, or rather, your future will be judged by your own life. So um, he rejects any unconditional promises. He rejects any unconditional promises. Jeremiah, in line with the Deuteronomic principle, um, by now, you should know this by heart. Deuteronomic principle. Fidelity brings blessings. Infidelity brings, uh, leads to punishment. Fidelity brings blessings. Infidelity leads to punishment. So this is the theology that uh, Jeremiah and uh, uh, some of the later prophets would subscribe to. While the former prophets, the earlier prophets like uh, Isaiah, etc., uh, believed in the royal Zion theology. And the historical events seem to prove Jeremiah right at this point of uh, history. Historical events seem to prove Jeremiah um, at this point of history because uh, uh, they will, the people of Israel, and the Deuteronomist uh, will uh, judge the events of the destruction of Jerusalem in the background of this fidelity. Uh, it is because people failed in their uh, um, responsibility of responding to God that uh, they lost their land had to be taken uh, into the land of exile, Babylonia, and that led to uh, the destruction of uh, God's own temple. Um, chapter 14, 17 to 18, the scenes of punishment, number of uh, the scenes of punishment. Um, we, um, in the so-called uh, uh, a reading of the office of the readings on a morning prayer, uh, we make use of this canticle uh, from Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 17 onwards. So this is uh, recited uh, when the Christian community gathered together on certain days on a morning prayer. Uh, Jeremiah describes the calamity uh, using figures of war, drought, unburied dead, hunger, and confused spiritual leaders. The intensity, the extremity of uh, the calamity uh, is uh, qualified in these figures of war, drought, unburied dead, hunger and the confused spiritual leaders. Um, and uh, it's not uh, verse 8, it should have been 18, verse 18, um, carries the great accusation against the leaders. It says, they have no knowledge. They have no knowledge. Um, People were not trained to obey God or they are not 
sufficiently instructed in the Torah, God's own laws. This is a great accusation against the leaders. Okay, that's why that of verse uh, 18, both prophet and priest ply their trade throughout the land. They have no knowledge. The primary duty of the priest and the prophet is to instruct the people on God's law. Um, they should, uh, they our duty is to carry on the tradition set by the Exodus uh, event. Okay. I think of my uh, setting of uh, the slide PPT has changed. I think um, I will uh, just try to see if I can adjust. Please hold on for a moment. I think some. Um, setting has changed. Oh, I think uh, um, I'm not really able to uh, set it right. Maybe when I send you the PPT, I will uh, correct it. Okay. okay. <clears throat> In uh, 14, the last part, 19 to 22, um, then what is there in uh, verse 10 to 12, the people plead their case casting themselves wholly on uh, God's mercy. Just look at um, verse um, uh, 19. Have you completely rejected Judah? We look for peace, but, no, but find no good. We, verse 20, we acknowledge our wickedness, O Lord, 
the iniquity of our ancestors for we have sinned against you do not spurn us for your name's sake remember and do not break your covenant with us now this is a wonderful prayer a wonderful prayer especially from verse 20 2021 a prayer of lamentation um, casting oneself completely on god's mercy in um, i'll just make a note on uh, an expression in verse 22 can any idols of the nations bring rain or can the heavens give showers is it not you o lord our god we set our hope on you, for it is you who do all this. Um, why do I um, mention these particular words? This goes in line with um, the historical and theological um, setting of the book of Jeremiah. Because, uh, see, um, the, not just at the time of Jeremiah, even centuries earlier and later, the Canaanite uh, Baal cult in, influenced uh, the worship in Israel. So why did they go after uh, Canaanite Baal, as I mentioned? Because of fertility, assurance of uh, rain. So Baal would have uh, guaranteed uh, uh, fertility of the field because of uh, the rain, snow, do that arrive at the proper time so these rites were also adopted by the israelites uh, which led into the idolatrous practices now uh, th now they are saying the present drought is a proof of their nonsense now it is not um a, a, sorry baal is not able to provide them with the shower rain at the correct time the actual drought shows the inability of baal and the canaanite gods it is god's own power god has decided to make them realize that the fertility rain showers dew snow they all come from Yahweh and not because of Baal. Okay. So they attribute their power to Yahweh. We go to chapter 15, where we will soon see the um, second confession of Jeremiah also. So Yahweh um, rejects the pleas of the people, that's 15, 1 to 5. Uh, now, two greatest intercessors in the Old Testament are mentioned by uh, Jeremiah. See, Moses and Samuel have been considered the greatest uh, intercessors of their own people. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you're already familiar with the Moses, how he interceded in the book of Exodus, also in Numbers. I'll just read for you. Uh, the prominent, uh, the pertinent uh, text from Exodus chapter 32, 11. You know, the intercessory role of uh, Moses. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fears, wrath. Change your mind. Okay, I repeat. Change his interceding. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. I have highlighted this word. Remember the covenantal word. The word, the, the covenantal phrase. Remember. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. To him he said, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised. Will give to your descendants and they shall inherit forever in perpetuity. 
look at verse 14 and the lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people see the the intercessory power of moses you know earlier in genesis uh, abraham did when he in a way bargained with god to save the people of sodom and gomorrah uh, in place of uh, 50 righteous people and you know the uh, bargaining uh, went on and on. So this is an example of the intercessory role of uh, Moses. We'll see one just sample uh, from Samuel. Okay, Samuel uh, chapter 12 verse 17 for Samuel. I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain and you shall know and see that the wickedness that you have done in the sight of the Lord is great in demanding a king for yourselves. So Samuel called upon the Lord and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. Just two examples. Oh, um, see, uh, there are uh, four instances, yeah, four references to Moses in the prophetic literature. One is what we have just uh, seen, um, and the other uh, is uh, um, one is a uh, fifteen chapter fifteen verse one, and the other three are from uh, Micah, Isaiah, and uh, Malachi. For, uh, for prophet who speak about uh, Moses. Uh, what is he trying to say? Even if the people's greatest intercessors were to plead for them, the sentence of total destruction would not be withdrawn. So uh, it's a very scandalizing statement. Huh? Uh, the greatest of the biblical intercessors cannot now plead for Israel. So instead of withdrawing the punishment, Yahweh sends four destroyers, which are they? Sword, dogs, birds, and beasts. Why? All these, because of the iniquity of Manasseh. Yesterday, I mentioned about Manasseh. I think the previous week also just mentioned about Manasseh. What is the iniquity of Manasseh? Uh, we can uh, refer to chapter uh, 21 of 2 Kings and 23, chapter 24. Okay, in short, uh, he is the one who uh, really brought about the um, worship of um, the Baal worship, uh, worship of Baal in the uh, precincts in the temple of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem. So this is uh, um, remembered by Prophet uh, Jeremiah. Manasseh is brought in to show the idolatrous practices that were introduced uh, in Israel. So he says also because of Manasseh, because of the idolatry. Yahweh is sending the four destroyers, sword, dogs, birds, and beasts. The response of Yahweh seems to be really blunt and cruel. Because the destruction of Jerusalem might appear cruel to many readers. Can God, who elsewhere is projected, whose definition is merciful, Steadfast, loving, tender, can he destroy Jerusalem? Okay, so uh, remember this. It is we are not uh, arguing about uh, God's action. The above this statement is the justification for the sin of Manasseh. So he, what he says: the present generation is wicked. 
and it's uh, because uh, uh, in a way uh, they also have uh, inherited that from uh, earlier kings but the responsibility is not just on uh, the earlier kings no the present generation is also responsible that is why the evil um, an instruction comes on the people um, in fact um, uh, words um, one that we mentioned is very extremely harsh um, yeah because he says though Moses and Samuel stood before me yet my heart would not turn towards his people send them out of my sight let them go like a, like get out, you know? send them out of my sight and let them go. So God does not seem to show any mercy and the response of God is blunt and cruel. It's a very gloomy uh, oracle, very gloomy oracle um, referring to Israel. Um, I think um, the historical context is the Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Judah and Jerusalem in 595, 97, 97. Um, Just um, highlight um, a few verses that may help us in this. One is um, yeah, verse 9. Sorry. She who bore seven has languished in an RSV or has grown feeble. She has fainted away. Her son went down while it was yet day. She has been ashamed and disgraced. And the rest of them I will give to the sword before the enemies, declares the Lord. What is this? Uh, she who bore seven has grown feeble. See, the um, having seven children, seven is a perfect number. Having seven children uh, is a sign of uh, God's blessing. We this phrase is also found in the uh, First Samuel chapter two five, the so-called uh, uh, canticle of uh, Hannah, which definitely has uh, influenced uh, the canticle of the, the New Testament Magnificat, uh, very similar, and also Ruth chapter 415, the, she who has bore, uh, she who bore seven. So, um, here it's used negative, even such a blessing as bearing seven children is now changed to a great curse because their sons, here it is used as S-U-N, because they are supposed to be um, the prime of their uh, life, you know? um, like um, definitely shining out you know, bright and they are taken away in the prime of their uh, young age. So this will bring definitely a sadness to the mothers. It's a curse. And a mother losing all the seven children. So this is uh, turned into curse and sorrow. Now we come to the second confession, uh, chapter 15, 22. 10 to 21, the second confession. In the background is this. Jeremiah points to his ostracism. He has been uh, um, eliminated. He has been uh, isolated, removed from the community. And he experiences rejection because of the life giving word that he gave to his people this is a background the prophet found himself 
in a situation of conflict conflict uh, with these people and conflict with god okay please keep in keep in mind these two things jeremiah finds himself in conflict with the people if that were alone it would have been okay but problem is that he also finds himself in conflict with god and when you uh, read this you might uh, be shocked the way um, the your vocabulary that uh, um, jeremiah uses so he is in conflict with his people and with god but you know he has the freedom and the sincerity to complain to the same god um, about his situation if you read the writings of uh, mystical mystics like both the teresa teresa of avila and teresa of uh, teresa of uh, child jesus um, you will see how they complain to uh, jesus or god um, as though they have been uh, um, you know in love for uh, centuries you know? very intense so but then they have the freedom okay so when there is some freedom we can uh, um, we can argue we can even uh, say things that are not pleasant accuse and even curse as uh, uh, jeremiah did you know to god so i think that uh, that shows the closeness of relationship so in this intensity of relationship you know, in this intensity of relationship there is a freedom so god can speak uh, uh, point accusing finger at uh, jeremiah which he will do and jeremiah also can accuse god in what to come as accuse god and still be friends okay, this is the beauty of uh, uh, this relationship uh, this complaint is cast in extremely severe terms uh, this is also a protection of the uh, inner crisis of uh, jeremiah that he went through during his uh, ministry so let's look at this verse 10 woe to me who is me my mother he is addressing his mother that you ever bore me a man of strife and const uh, and contention the whole land so he is addressing his mother why was i born uh that language and the tone will take us uh, close to uh, job you know? book of job chapter 3 verse 3 book of job uh um, jeremiah's call is dated from his mother's womb all of us know that we have been reading that at least twice we read that particular passage of the call of jeremiah the cursing the day of his birth would mean nothing else than rejection of his very mission because he was given the mission on the day of his birth so the cursing the day of his birth would also mean cursing the rejection or the rejection curse or the rejection of his own very mission so when he bemoans his birth he also bemoans his calling as a prophet um but in verse 11 what the lord says i have strengthened you jeremiah i have strengthened you jeremiah has no reason to complain about his hardships as yahweh has been faithful to his promise to sustain him firmly like uh, my grace today is uh, those who following the latin rite reading the first reading today from saint paul says 
um, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, who having gone through uh, many hardships, and he even speaks of a thorn in the flesh, and asked God to remove it. God did not remove it. But God said, I'm not going to remove it, but my grace is sufficient for you. And Jeremiah is given this. Jeremiah is given this because uh, uh, God has never promised that he would remove hardships. But God said he would be faithful to his promise and would sustain him, would sustain him firmly in thick and thin throughout. So that does not mean that he will eliminate uh, hardships and uh, opposition. Uh, he calls himself, Jeremiah calls himself as a man of uh, strive. It is what Yahweh intended him to be in uh, chapter 1 verse 10. He was meant to be a man of uh, strive. So uh, what brought persecution to Jeremiah is not his personal character, is not his moral life, but the message that he preached, this message that displeased the ears of people. Um, in verse 12 to 14, there is a decree from God that the enemies of Jeremiah would be punished and they would become victims of defeat and exile. Uh, if we look at the vocabulary, it's evident. In verse 13 already, I will give us plunder without price for all your sins. I will make you serve your enemies. Verse 15, Jeremiah is not satisfied with the answer that the Lord gave. No, your enemies will be taken into captivity and they will be punished. Jeremiah is not uh, satisfied with that answer. It's because you have been saying that uh, um, you were faithful to me, uh, but you know, the facts contradict your statement. It, uh, Jeremiah tells God, he says, uh, uh, the strong desire for vengeance against his persecutors is uh, uh, highlighted elsewhere also in the prophetic literature uh, in the message of Jeremiah chapter 11, chapter 17, chapter 20 and so on. So, um, please remember this. Do not be scandalized. The prayer, uh, the so-called curse, prayer for curse, prayer cursing other people. It is technically called imprecatory psalms. In this book of psalms, we have a few psalms. Imprecatory psalms or psalms of curse. How do you justify this? It is because um, retribution, retribution is done on this earth at a time when they did not believe in life after death, it is in this, or even if they believe, it is on during life on this earth that God judges. So um, your uh, blessing should come when you are alive. If you are wicked, the curse should come on you when you are alive. So um, if um, an oppressor, if a wicked person, prospers, it is, a, uh, it is an accusation, it is, uh, you know, in better commas, a failure on the part of God to uh, his own promise in Deuteronomy. You know, if you are faithful, you will be blessed. If you are unfaithful, you will be cursed. But what is taking place here? The wicked people flourish. So this is even a effect on your own statement. So uh, the desire to punish other people and the curse on others 
is to be understood in this uh, uh, theology, in this perspective, that uh, reward or punishment will be meted out, uh, will be rewarded during one's own lifetime. Uh, please look at uh, the, the first element of the lament. We'll see there are four uh, imperatives. There are four imperatives. We are in verse 15. Okay. Remember, O Lord, you know. Remember. Second, visit. They are imperatives. Remember, visit, take revenge, bring down retribution for me or my persecutors. Take revenge. And finally, do not take away. Do not take away. Do not take me away. In your forbearance, do not take me away. For uh, four imperatives. Um, what's the purpose of this imperative? The use of the imperatives suggest the strong emotions of the prophet and his freedom to talk to God candidly as did Moses before him. Moses did that in the book of Numbers chapter 11. You can check it up in chapter 11. Verses 11 to 15. Even uh, uh, Moses had the freedom to speak candidly, open up his uh, heart and strong emotion to God. Um, I, Jeremiah does that. Uh, why is he making this statement? His petition is also based on the previous promises of Yahweh. He said, remember all that the Lord has said. In verse 15, C to 17, second part, we find the second element of the lament. The reasons for Yahweh to act in his favor and the statement of innocence. Why should the Lord act in the favor, in favor of uh, Jeremiah? Yes, the prophet suffers a reproach for Yahweh's sake. So it is not for the prophet himself that prophet suffers. He suffers for the sake of Yahweh. Secondly, he accepted Yahweh's mandate with joy. Whatever the Lord commanded him, he accepted it with joy. Thirdly, the prophet is called by Yahweh's name. Uh, once again, Yahweh's name, you know, called by Yahweh's name. I mentioned a couple of, a few minutes ago, the sign of salvific protection, God's protection. The prophet is called by Yahweh's name. Uh, there is the statement of his innocence. First of all, prophet says, I have not sat or rejoiced with the merrymakers. Verse 17, I did not sit in the company of merry makers, nor did I rejoice. So he accepted the isolation from others for the sake of his mandate. Um, verse 16, going back, your words were found and I ate them and uh, your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. How do we explain this? Your words were found and I ate them. Yahweh had placed his own words in the prophet's mouth. I mentioned that the prophet is the mouthpiece of God. Um, those when you read um, earlier, Ezekiel, Ezekiel had to eat a scroll inscribed with Yahweh's words. This is the dramatic definition of the prophet's mission 
as their minister of God's word. Hebrew word is Dabar. Okay? Dabar Adonai, the word of God. He, Jeremiah uses this uh, 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 Hebrew term. The, there's a lot of drama coming, also coming up in the, in the book of Jeremiah. So placing the words in the mouth of a prophet. He speaks God's word. Uh, once again, I am called by your name, mentioned. The expression reveals the protective presence of God on his messenger. The prophet is um, protected by Yahweh because he is uh, God's malachi, God's messenger. In verse 18, another element in the complaint. Why is there unceasing pain? The questions that uh, uh, Jeremiah is uh, asking. Why is there unceasing pain? Why is his wound incurable and unhealed? Why does Yahweh act like an unreliable brook that dries up when water is most needed? Unreliable brook. We'll explain. Uh, Jeremiah uses actually the word treacherous brook, which is elsewhere translated as uh, um, unreliable uh, brook or yeah, unreliable brook. Yes. You know, during the summertime, most Palestinians, Palestinian brooks dry up. Um, here, that is in um, chapter 15, 18, not 18. Yes, 18. Um, they symbolize a profound deception. That's why unreliable brook deception. But the, the brooks are supposed to provide water. Uh, Jeremiah boldly accuses uh, Yahweh of having forsaken him. And the climax is the present uh, crisis that is expressed in the uh, confession of uh, Jeremiah. Um, another uh, familiar word that you should remember in verse 17, the hand of God, the hand of God. The hand stands for the power, but often the hand of God in the Isaiah, Ezekiel, and so on uh, is written in the context of uh, inspiration. So when you say, uh, for example, verse 17, under the weight of your hand, I sat alone. Protection. Protection. But this is used negatively. So even that becomes a burden, becomes a burden under the weight of your hand. I am, I sat alone. Um, and finally, versus uh, this chapter uh, 15, um, if you have got questions, uh, please uh, address to me personally the, uh, to the, ch the chat box. Is, um, Brother Samuel has to leave for the prayer. Okay. The renewal of the mission of the prophet. Renewal of the mission of the prophet is the end of uh, chapter 15. God applies Jeremiah's own message to himself. God promises no respite from opposition, but promising him constant support. Yeah, please take note of this. That being a prophet does not um, insulate you, does not uh, keep all the problems from you. You are not insulated. But, but Yahweh's constant support is assured. Um, he will have to endure persecution, opposition, but God is going to support him. There is no doubt about it. Um, because um, uh, already 
God had asked Jeremiah to be his mouthpiece. Now he asks him to continue as God's mouthpiece. Um, there you see four times the word return is mentioned four times. Um, we are in verse 19. Okay, Four times the word turn or return. Turn back and RS will be returned. Um, it is again in the conditional. It is the conditional assurance. No? If you turn back, if you turn back, I will take you back. Uh, and that's for Jeremiah. First of all, it is for Jeremiah. It says, if Jeremiah returns, it means dedicate himself more fully to Yahweh, then Yahweh will return to him. If Jeremiah returns or dedicate himself more fully to Yahweh, then Yahweh will return to him. Yahweh will stand by him. That's the first condition. That is the condition. Yahweh, Jeremiah has to do it and Yahweh will stand by him. Second condition. He should only utter God's word, which are precious words, and not what is pleasing to people which are worthless, unlike the false prophets. So that's the second condition. You should only utter God's words that are precious and not that other people that will only please them and they are worthless. And this will result in people returning to the prophet, which means returning to Yahweh himself. So we just conclude this chapter, the main and the chapter and especially the confession, second confession of uh, Jeremiah. The main point in this confession is, will Yahweh who called the prophet will stand by him and support him in times of uh, crisis? This is a question that is asked. Will Yahweh who called the prophet will stand by him and support him in times of a crisis. Because uh, Jeremiah feels that in moments of uh, extreme need of Yahweh, he could not feel the presence of Yahweh. So this Yahweh's presence was promised at the time of his vocation. We saw in chapter eight, chapter one, verse eight and 19. But unfortunately, Jeremiah has not experienced that so far. He has only received so far hostility of his own people because he spoke unpleasant material. He spoke about unpleasant, spoke unpleasant things to um, people. And he felt that Yahweh was not with him in time of need. Now we go to chapter 16, another um, uh, interesting chapter, chapter 16 is a short chapter, comparatively. 21, it's also 21, but we'll finish, um, I think I can finish it up. Uh, prophetic word is delivered not only through symbolic actions. Uh, prophets uh, uh, not only speak, they speak through their own actions, sometimes they act out. Yesterday I spoke about the parables, parables that are spoken, literary parables, and the parables that are acted out. So there are different uh, prophets who have uh, acted out the parables, lived out in the personal life of the prophets. So it's not just a momentary uh, action, but something that affects the whole life. For example, Hosea chapter one to three, he marries a prostitute. Ezekiel is asked in chapter 24, um, uh, 24 in the context of uh, the impact, uh, the, the, the destruction of uh, uh, Jerusalem. So, um, he is asked not to um, cry. Is asked not to cry 
at the death of the wife of Ezekiel. So he was uh, uh, his, his the wife, in fact the what is written the delight of your eyes. His wife is called the delight of his eyes, and she died at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. But God told Ezekiel not to cry. And then Isaiah chapter 8, you can read by himself. Now, what is uh, God asking him? Celibacy. God is asking Jeremiah to not to get married and not to have uh, children. This is uh, um, binding on uh, Jeremiah. See, uh, I'll just uh, quickly uh, situate this uh, issue. See, in the ancient Near East and in the Israel, a large family was a sign of divine blessing. Genesis 22, 17. Large family. Uh, to, in fact, the promise made to um, uh, Abraham, love children as many as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore. So abundance, numerous children, um, be a sign of a divine blessing. Uh, Psalm 127, sons are indeed a heritage to the Lord, a fruit of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. So, on the other hand, sterility, sterility is a terrible curse. Think of uh, Genesis chapter 30. Um, the um, steril, sterility of uh, Rachel or the sterility of uh, Hannah in the first Samuel. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah's celibacy was not his personal choice, but an order received from the Lord because it was not uh, celibacy was not considered in the noble at that time. Instead, you have children, a number of children would be the sign of God's blessing. In this um, situation, chapter 16, Jeremiah is asked uh, neither to marry nor to have children as a symbol of the severity of the coming disasters on uh, Judah and her population. Uh, when you read this, uh, verse uh, 1 itself, in this place, and verse 3, in this place and in this land, suggests that the judgment is imminent on the land of Judah and uh, Jeremiah should not spend time in the, with the family. So his uh, duty is now to preach uh, to the people of uh, Israel. So he is asked not to join the mourning and not to join the feasting. Why? Yahweh has taken away the covenantal uh, promises. Shalom, Hesed, and Rahamim. Peace, um, uh, steadfast love, and mercy. He has taken away these from uh, Judah. So there is no use in uh, mourning. They have been uh, the blessings given by Yahweh, but Jeremiah is forbidden to experience that. And verse 6 will give you the indications of uh, uh, mourning, traditional mourning. You know, incisions, shaved heads or beards were signs of mourning. Jeremiah is prevented from doing that. Um, see, verse 7 speaks about the funeral meals. No one shall break bread for the mourner. To offer comfort for the dead. Nor shall anyone give them the cup of consolation to drink for the fathers and the mothers. You know, um, I think something I will just uh, make a point clearly. See, uh, what are these meals? It could mean two things. One, meals taken at the occasion of death. You know, maybe in uh, India, South India, it may be different. But you know, Western countries. At the, at the death, even in the I know many tribes, in the many uh, traditions in the north northeast, I have seen a uh, big feast or a big meal is served at the time of uh, death before funeral. Uh, sometimes together with the dead person, you know, meal is served or soon after the funeral. But it's also offered to dead persons. We have references in Hosea, Ezekiel. 
and the thing of a Tobit, the four verse 17 speaks clearly of food offered to the dead and excavations done in the tombs prove that the food was offered to the dead people. So even today, I've seen in the many cultures, you know, which is uh, coming from the very ancient custom, you know, they think that uh, uh, the dead person will eat. So the best of uh, the food that they would have enjoyed their lifetime is offered on the anniversary or after the death or during the funeral, etc. Now the second part, Jeremiah is also asked not to uh, uh, not to go for any joyful gatherings. So neither to mourn nor to enjoy the gatherings because uh, God's steadfast love is removed and there is no need for uh, Jeremiah to go for any uh, social interaction. Uh, end of uh, chapter 16 or middle of chapter 16 is the Judah's fate. Um, the exile would be the punishment because it's a repetition of ideas. Uh, Jeremiah repeats that. But I'll say something uh, special here. They will be condemned. So, so um, exile is not only removal from expulsion from your land, but it has its consequence. What is that? Worshipping false god in exile. You know, uh, before the uh, strict monotheism was introduced in Israel, uh, Yahweh was considered to be the family God. In Exodus, I mentioned that when God revealed himself as uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, who you, I am, who am, that is the personal God of Israel. It's a personal pride of Israel. While Elohim is uh, more universal. It's a personal God. So Yahweh was the private limited God of uh, Israelites. So, when they go to, uh, so the power of, let's say, they believed or they understood that Yahweh lives only at that time. The belief, they live, Yahweh has got uh, sovereignty only within the Israel. So when they move out of Israel, they have to worship or they have um, the other, the power of the other gods, false gods. They have to worship other false gods, false gods. And it looks as though with Jeremiah, shared this view. Uh, chapter uh, 16, 14, 15 is the homecoming of Israel. They are coming back and that is uh, uh, celebrated as the new exodus. Um, and the punishment is uh, um, sending fishers and hunters verses 16 to 18. So God is sending Fishers and hunters. Now that is taken. Uh, you know, um, they, it is symbolic. They, these two words, fishers and hunters, refer to the foreign invasion by the Egyptians and Babylon. We have uh, this clue from the uh, prophet Habakkuk. So fishers and hunters refer to Egypt or Babylon. Uh, finally. Uh, the conversion of the pagan people. It is a co covenantal prayer of trust. Uh, recognizing the vanity of their idol worship, all nations will join in worshiping the omnipotent God, which is also shared by Isaiah and uh, Micah. That's why we conclude in the, uh, verse 21. Therefore, I am surely going to teach them this time I am going to teach them my power and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. See, even in uh, Isaiah, towards the second, the last part of Isaiah, the second Isaiah, you know, the and also third Isaiah, the idea is there. Others uh, will, uh, uh, other gods, other nations also will come to worship uh, Yahweh God and join the people of Israel to worship this uh, Yahweh God. Okay, I think it's time. Um, I, um, okay, I think okay, okay now uh, we will take up the uh, third lament of Jeremiah in the next class um, that is in uh, chapter 17, 14 to 18. Um, then the fourth uh, confession is also in chapter 18. Um, the fifth one is in uh, chapter 20.
um, so we will um, move faster in the next class uh, let me just see if i have uh, oh, i can spend a couple of four oh, oh, sorry I think, um, brother, one second. Uh, uh, can you explain more about Sinaitic covenant theology? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll quickly, I'll say, say, if you have got any questions, please um, uh, forward it to me, I'll, uh, maybe I'll answer it next time. Uh, what, uh, what, as I see here, can you explain more about Sinaitic covenant theology? Okay, pretty simple. Um, on Mount Sinai, God said, you shall be my people and uh, I will be your God. You shall be my people and I will be your God. But there is a condition that they have to obey the commandment. Uh, that uh, Torah, the Ten Commandments were given to them. And uh, uh, by obeying, they become God's people. So if you don't obey, then they don't become God's people. That is in short, uh, the covenant, the Sinaiti covenant theology, covenant made on Mount Sinai. Uh, okay, I think there are a few things. I will just uh, copy this. I will uh, I take uh, maybe in the beginning of this class or the end of this class, I will take up this. I think because it's time. So thank you for uh, being with me, with us, for joining together. Wish you a wonderful Sunday tomorrow and a good weekend. And let's conclude in the name of the Holy Trinity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. God be praised. May the blessing of the Lord be with you. God be blessed. And uh, wish you a wonderful Sunday. God bless.